The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Dr. Doreen grand is the... Dr. Doreen is an expert in autism. Doreen grand Dr. grand Dr. Doreen grand Dr. Doreen grand is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask her questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Good morning and welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen. I'm Shannon Penrod and look who we have here with us, the beautiful, talented and fabulous Dr. Doreen Grampuche. Good, I'm going to say good morning, but it's really good evening where you are, isn't it, Dr. Grampuche? It is. Yes, it is. It's evening. Good, uh, good morning and good evening, Shannon. How are you? I am so excited to be here with you. I'm, uh, I'm going to try not to get stupid and cry here, but I, I have to say, I saw something amazing the other night and I texted you immediately afterwards. I don't think you realized I was sobbing when I texted you and said how oh. grateful I am to have you in my life and how I don't know how I got so lucky to know you, but I did say to you, that I'm going to spend the rest of my life telling people about you because I'm so grateful to have you in my life. Oh, well, thank you, Shannon. I love you. You were making me all emotional when you sent that text too. I, and I'm, I'm, I'm working over here in this other part of the world. I know. And you were on a, I, you were on a plane. I don't know how in this technology I'm able to talk to you by text on a plane. That makes no sense. But my husband came in the room and I was sobbing like ugly cry. And he said, Oh no, what's happening? Did someone die and I said no I'm just so grateful how did we get so lucky that we got to meet Dr. Grand Pichet? like where would we be if it wasn't for her and how, the, how she helped our child I went to the whole ugly cry so for those of you who don't know Dr. Grand Pichet is a true expert in the field of autism she's been working in this field thank God for more than 40 did, did 45 are we saying more than 45 years? that's ridiculous that is absolutely yeah. ridiculous. No one would look at you. No one would even believe that you are 40, over 45. So, uh, but she has been, and as I said, thank God, and I don't say that lightly, uh, because she's been able to help my family and so many other families. And I'm so thrilled that I have the privilege of sharing her with all of you across the world right now, uh, if you're watching us. We are live right now on YouTube, and we are live on my personal Facebook page. So I hope that you know, those of you uh, who are looking for us on the other pages, find us on those two pages. Because, and we'll, later on, the show will be podcasting in all the places and it'll be available on all those other sites a little bit later on today. But I'm really thrilled that you guys have the opportunity to ask her questions in real time. You can find the show in so many different places. We're on iHeartRadio. Chris is gonna show you all those places, our fabulous Chris. But um, you do have the opportunity to be writing in right now. If you go to my personal Facebook page, Shannon Penrod, or you can go to YouTube, you can be writing in your questions right now. We do have some questions to start. Uh, Chris is also showing you that if you want to subscribe to the podcast, you can subscribe in lots of different ways. If you want to get the ad-free version, you go to glow.fm slash autism live. It is a small monthly fee. It's even less if you buy it by the year. And that's if you want to get it ad free. Otherwise, it's free to you um, and you get to listen to all the wonderful people that are advertising that are keeping us on the air. So, Dr. Grand Pichet, um, so excited that you are here this morning. We're going to start with a topic. Um, and, I, and I've got a couple of questions about the topic, but we're open to any topics, you guys. If you guys have a question and you want to write in, you can do that right now wherever you're watching us live. But our topic is anxiety, which we could talk about that every episode till the end of time, and there would still be more to cover. Um, so please feel free to write in your questions now, but I'm going to get started with a question that a mom wrote to us earlier this week. And I kind of had some questions and I thought that you might, Dr. Grampiche. So I went ahead and asked her the question. She gave the answers. So we're going to have a bit of a sped up conversation here. But the first question was, my seven-year-old son has severe anxiety. He also perceives things differently than others and will perceive threat where there is none. 
For example, someone brushing past him translates to someone hitting him. This probably contributes to his anxiety. He never lets me leave the house at not, night, not even if my husband is there to watch him. What can I do biomedically and therapeutically to help my son? So you ready for the questions that I asked her? <laughs> and then you'll, and you'll have to tell me Go what ahead. I missed, Dr. Grampiche, that you wished I had asked. So my first question was, mm -hmm. did the anxiety come on suddenly after an illness, for instance, a sore throat or after an event? Her answer was, he has been anxious since he has been two years old and began attending daycare. Currently, it gets worse with strep infections. And later, when I said to her, is he having any other health issues, she said he has pandas. Mm -hmm. So we definitely want to talk about that. But other questions that I asked, uh, is he able to be away from you for other things, for school and et cetera? And she said the anxiety is related to school and bedtime primarily. I asked what his diet is like. I hope you're proud of me. Um, he, she said he does not drink milk and otherwise has limited dairy intake. He does not eat vegetables, but he does eat protein for supper each day. Very limited junk food. Snacks consist of cookies, chips, popcorn. He is a selective eater. I asked, does he have issues with constipation or diarrhea? She says he has severe constipation since he was eight months old, still a problem. And I asked, what is his sleep like? She said he has difficulty falling asleep. He seems well rested in the morning, does not seem tired during the day. What did I forget okay. to ask? What medications he might be taking, <laughs> but I'm guessing he's not on anything. Okay. So, uh, But mom, if you're so watching, write in and tell us. Okay. Yeah. So there's a lot to kind of unwrap here, but th those were great questions. Thank you so much, Shannon. Very helpful. Um, we'll start with the pandas. For people who don't know, um, there are situations where a child is exposed to strep when they're young, and then they develop what's called pediatric autoimmune neurological dysfunction associated with strep, pandas. And it, um, Pandas has very si similar symptoms to autism, oddly, and um, there are some tr treatments that can be done for pandas, but they're pretty long term and essentially we're dealing with sort of a common side effect and it's not necessarily just the pandas that is causing that a lot of children with autism have anxiety. And so we should just focus on the anxiety and how we can try to make things better. Um, and, you know, sometimes we're talking about anxiety in the sense that uh, there are situations that cause the anxiety. There could also be kind of an internal feeling that causes anxiety. Sometimes kids who do, do have uh, sleep issues, he doesn't sound like he does, but uh, he has, he's not falling asleep, but that's very common for someone who has anxiety. Um, and sometimes children who have gastrointestinal issues like constipation develop anxiety also because they are experiencing some pain. Um, and just intestinal discomfort uh, can often lead to anxiety. So, but in general, the symptoms of autism will in many, many cases lead to anxiety. I mean, let's just think about that for a minute. So not being able to understand clearly what's going on around us that on its own would make anyone anxious, um, you know, being placed under like demands being placed on you and you're not necessarily able to perform or um, reply appropriately is going to make you anxious. Incoming stimuli, if you're dysregulated, some stimuli could make you hyperstimulated and that could, you know, make you feel anxious. Um, there's a variety of different aspects of autism. And when you think about it, um, I always, when I do a presentation on anxiety, I, I say it is much more likely that you will have anxiety than not, because you're uh, not really understanding everything around you. And that's pretty uh, you know, scary. And also, um, you, as, as mom said very well, 
you perceive things a little bit differently. And part of that is just because you don't really understand. So, he, you know, as mom gave a great example, um, is he might misunderstand things that occur in his environment that are accidental and not intentional. And therefore he might consider them to be intentional and therefore he might feel like you know, um, others are not, being around other people is not safe. Other people might, might be mocking me. Other people might be intentionally trying to hurt me. And those types of things will obviously lead to, you know, anxiety, right? So all of kind of not understanding other people's intentions, um, having sensory dysregulation, not understanding language, uh all of these types of things uh will result in anxiety so it's understandable that he has anxiety now the question is what do we do about it so there are two main things to do about it one is sort of behavioral or cognitive behavioral and the other one is medication so starting with medication uh anti-anxiety medications are the same as antidepressants so I would recommend that you speak with a uh, psychiatrist and discuss these anxieties and ask for potentially an SSRI medication, serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which often does help our children just be a little bit less anxious. Like it takes the edge off. It doesn't change their personality. Um, it doesn't cause long-term harm of any type. It just kind of makes the child less uh, worried, let's put it that way, less apprehensive. And then in terms of cognitive or just straight on behavioral therapy, um, we treat the anxieties, the, the various things that provoke anxiety in the, the same way we treat phobias. So the primary way that you deal with anxiety in a behavior, pure behavioral methodology is systematic desensitization. And that is to um, gradually expose the child to anxiety provoking stimuli. So progressively more anxiety prov provoking stimuli and pair that with some sort of relaxation or some other stimulus that is calming. So for instance, if, let's say the child uh, feels very relaxed and calm when they are holding their blanket or you know, I don't know, watching something or listening to music, different things that calm our kids down. And you would pair that calming experience with uh, a variety of like stimuli that represent the anxiety provoking things. So for example, a, a picture of school, uh, you know, a picture of the classroom, maybe going into the classroom, a video of the classroom, and then the classroom or school itself, if school is one of those. So essentially you would then gradually, first through uh, not in real life, but kind of using those stimuli, you would help the child almost prepare. And then you would gradually expose the child to the school. Um, and it's a shaping procedure. It's very simple to do, but it does take a little bit of time. So you would do gradual exposure um paired with lots and lots of reinforcers and stuff so in other words you would let's say uh, it, through systematic desensitization you would teach the child not to have that real severe like fear reaction when separating from mom but then you would also take environments that mom is not in and you would highly make those highly rewarding so you could have reinforcers available to the child that are not otherwise available if mom is there um, and those are some ways where you can gradually but this is it's not uncommon and you know if you if it, the, depending on the child's like understanding of language you can go further into cognitive behavior therapy as well where you are giving the child um, like uh, exercises you know, we used to, there was, there was something that entered the world of autism called social stories. And it along, they're very similar to cognitive behavioral exercises where you essentially are giving the child uh, rules around the behavior that you want to change. And so, for example, you could say, you could write, if the child has this level of comprehension, 
you could talk to the child about, you know, these are some things that are good about school and you could, that would help. And the child would list all the wonderful things about school, including all the reinforcers that he would get there. Then you would say, here are some things that you can do if you get scared. Like you can have a picture of mom in your pocket. You can take that out. You can, um, you know, ask to go to the principal's office and call mom. Um, you can have a favorite stuffed animal with you. It depends on every child. But these are things that then you would review with the child in the morning when they go so that like you've given the child like a certain amount of self-awareness of what's going on and you've assured them that things are going to be okay. Then I wouldn't like take the child without, I mean, ideally you would replace mom with someone else so that the, like, let's say dad or a sibling or a family member who the child feels comfortable with. And then you would gradually fade that person back and out as well. So there's lots of different ways people do this. Sometimes people prefer to flood, which essentially means drop them off at school and let them take care of it. Um, but, you know, there are most people prefer to do some form of shaping or fading type of schedule. And I can tell you that along with the medications, this is very doable. You just have to spend the time to gradually um, have your child exposed to those situations and then reward very much reward the child being able to tolerate those situations without mom and that's how you start to uh, help the child get over separation anxiety thank you for that can we talk for a minute though about because what comes up for me is that um, I know that I was this way as a parent and I talk to a lot of parents on a daily basis where, where before we have access to you and your wisdom, one of the things that we do is that we find ways to wake, make our day work. And we don't even notice how upside down we're getting. Where mm -hmm. I've talked to parents who, and it becomes your new normal, right? That we all do things in a way to not upset our child and not upset the the apple cart, right? The, 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 the schedule, right? The schedules the, hate us. Yes. The, the parent who explained to me that um, their child couldn't go to school that week, and and I said, oh, is he not feeling well? And she said, no, they're doing work on the street that we typically go to school on. And if we go another way, it's it's pointless because he has a meltdown so badly, so we're, we're so he's not going to school this week. And and bless her heart, I know that to her that sounded rational, and I have participated in that kind of thinking before. So if any of you are like, oh, that doesn't sound right, but remember, like we've all done it at some point where we go, oh no, we you know we don't allow the microwave to ding or. We do, whatever it is, we never open that patio door because once we or, open it, our child has to open and close it a hundred times, right? Or people will wall off a part of the house or whatever because that's the only way that they can work around their child's anxiety. And then we take on this thing where, where we've created this environment to make sure that we don't set it off, but it becomes a house of cards that is so- shells. Yes, we're walking on eggshells, we're living in fear, and it has become our new normal. So when somebody comes into that situation, like you, Dr. Grant Fichet, and is talking sense saying, okay, we're gonna work on this, I gotta say, for me, what came up when that happened for me was fear. But you're gonna set oh, him yeah. off, and I don't know how to, what to do with that. I don't know if I can deal with it. So right. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the anxiety on the parent side of when we start to work on anxiety with our kiddos and the fear that's there. Yeah, for sure. And it's interesting because I always use this as an example, not anxiety per se, but avoidance, right? Mm. We avoid things that are unpleasant and, uh, and anxiety uh, is unpleasant for our child. And so our child will avoid situations that cause the anxiety, but in turn, we avoid situations that cause us anxiety and distress. And one of those situations is seeing our child in distress. So it's, you're, you're avoiding 
the situation of having your child have a meltdown, you know, which is very natural for all of us to do. Um, it's one of those things. It's like a lot of parents will come to me and say, yeah, I, I mean, you know, he sleeps with us because that's the only way he's going to sleep. And I'll talk to them and I'll say, well, OK, but like he's six now. How much longer are we going to do this? At what point are, are we ready to teach him no matter what? He has to learn that it's not okay for him to sleep with you. You know what I mean? And sooner or later, we face those challenges because we have to. Um, and this is one of those where the sooner you face this challenge, the better, because the longer it goes on, it just becomes more ingrained. Um, for a child who has separation anxiety and is, let's say, six or seven or eight or so, and we've still not dealt with it, it can become harder and harder as the child ages. Um, it, it becomes much more of a habit and it becomes harder because the child is getting older. So it is important to deal with it and you should prepare yourself and get as many people as you'd like to come and support you. Like, you know, this is where I always say it takes a village. So get friends, get family, get people to be there because you're right, Shannon. It's not just about, you know, setting a schedule that will take a few days of actually doing this by the book. And by the way, guys, I really, really recommend if you can, when these situations come up, if you can get a behavior analyst or some, or even a psychologist to help you with this, it's much more helpful for lots of reasons. Like when you follow a uh, either a systematic desensitization program or any kind of cognitive behavioral program, you write things out very specifically because what you're doing is you're like extending the duration of time by one minute or 30 seconds. And it kind of is very methodical and you have to follow these instructions and it works if you do that. And if you are random about it, it doesn't work. So it's really recommended that you try to get a professional or you can look up and read about how to do these procedures and just use forms and be very systematic about it. And um, and yeah, get support because the more challenging it becomes for your child, the more challenging it becomes for you. And we don't want you to have, a, for you to fall apart when your child starts to say, oh no, please mommy, I don't wanna go. And those types of things that really melt our hearts and make it so difficult for us as parents to comply. So you want to make sure that you have support there for you. Yeah, I think that is so key. I, I, you know, the, the piece that's always missing for me is that everybody has to be willing, right? And, and so often, you know, that I'm back talking with parents a lot. And, and, I, and I don't mean to make it sound like parents aren't willing, but sometimes it feels like doing the intervention will be bigger than mm -hmm. what you can do. And I love you saying that we have to have support as well. Um, but it's worth it. Can we take a second and talk about that? Because we've seen what happens when we don't deal with anxiety. Because this is the other piece of it, Dr. Grampiche, is that a lot of times people will tell us or we will tell ourselves, oh, they'll just grow out of it. But you mm -hmm. have seen more than anybody that sometimes these things grow and flourish. And the longer we wait, I would imagine the worse it gets. It does. It, anxiety actually is one of those. I'm glad you said that because it can overgeneralize. So in other words, you could like, I, you know, you could start with an anxiety about that. This is what happened to my son. I mean, a very good example. It just came to my mind. Um, we were in uh, Germany and he had not really been ever, he was very little, he was probably two, and he'd not really been exposed to thunder, right? Because before that, he was living in California. <laughs> we don't have thunder in California. So very rare. We're in Germany and he was playing on the playground and um, with some cousins and stuff. And um, it started to rain and thunder. And one of the older cousins picked him up and ran to the house kind of playfully saying, oh, we better run. It's thunder and all that. That scared him. And then he became terrified of not just thunder, which a lot of kids are afraid of that sound because it's very scary. But he became afraid of rain 
because he wasn't mm. familiar with rain. And the, the fear of rain then started to grow in two ways. It was very interesting. It started to generalize internally, so to water sources in the house. So taking a bath, to going to swimming, those types of things, as well as just going out because there was always a fear that it's going to rain and have thunder. So this anxiety started to increase tremendously. And I actually had to, I remember it was like one summer, I spent days and days uh, exposing him, shaping him to all the different fears that he had developed because of that one incident. So anxiety can spread. It's not a um, logical feeling. It's a reaction that depends on fear. And fear is not logical. Fear is something that grows in your mind that it expands. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for all of that. I want to say that I got it a little bit wrong before. We are, we are live right now on the Facebooks. So okay. we're live right, but not on my Facebook. We're live on Autism Live Facebook. We're live on Autism Network Facebook, on uh, Stories from the Spectrum, and Ask Dr. Doreen Facebook. So I hope you guys are finding us. I see that some of you are. Uh, I also want to, our beloved Parker wrote to us this week. And, I, and, uh, and I'm so excited for him because he's accepted a job in food service and it's gone well so far, but I have a question. Um, he wants, uh, and he wanted both of our perspectives on it and I wrote to him before about it. He says, my coworkers are great, but my schedule is limited and I'm afraid of jealousy and my coworkers uh, over that, from my coworkers over that. My current coworkers are fine as far as I know, but since I am getting new coworkers and a new manager tomorrow as I'm writing this, I don't want any jealousy. The reason why my schedule is so limited is due to my disability benefits. How can I get along with my coworkers? And I just wanna say that when I wrote back to him, I said, isn't that interesting, Parker, that a lot of people think that people on the spectrum don't have perspective taking but look at Parker, perspective taking, thinking, well, if I were a coworker and I saw that somebody else was getting a preferential schedule, that might make me jealous. I was like, mm -hmm. I, I was just noticing that. And I was like, look at you doing that. But um, what, what advice do you have for him, Dr. Grand Pichet, that he is getting um, a different experience working than his coworkers, and he is having some anxiety about what they think of him. What do you want to say to him about that? So, you know, this is one of the great things about you, Parker, is that you analyze situations so deeply. I don't think you should worry about this just yet. First of all, it hasn't happened. Um, secondly, it's also likely that you're co-workers might be looking for more work. A lot of people these days are looking for more hours, not less hours. So it's possible that they will not be jealous at all. So let's just wait and see. People will have different perspectives. Let's just wait and see how people respond. But in the meantime, it's always a good idea to learn how to um, get along with your co-workers. And I think there are a few things um, that you should pay attention to. One is like, it's, you know, try to follow their lead. So in other words, if it's a scenario where your coworkers are chatting, join in by all means and chat. If it's a scenario where no, it's a pretty quiet environment and people are not in the mood to have social conversation, then maybe that's an that's a time where you should just focus on the job. Um, if you see coworkers, uh, you know, responding positively to something you did, that you need to do more of that. If you see coworkers kind of backing off or feeling a little awkward, you need to maybe bring that scenario back here to us or to anyone else that you discuss things with and have them try to help you understand that scenario. A lot of jobs, and I don't know your job where and where you are, but a lot of jobs actually will even give you a coach who can help you uh, understand call of not just the coworkers and how to get along with them, but subtle rules that might have to do with the job or 
things that the employer wants you to do or doesn't want you to do, and it's not written down anywhere. So find out, because job coaches at work can be very, very useful. But right now, I don't want you to worry about something that hasn't happened. Let's wait and see what actually happens. Amazing. Uh, Taryn has written in and said, hi, ladies. My four-year-old ASD son is in 35 hours a week um, in center ABA. He's doing really well. Recently, he started mimicking peers' disobedient de behaviors at the center. His team is aware, but I'm wondering, is this normal? Yeah, it's normal and it's unfortunate and his team should do something about it right away. Of course, it's normal and it's great that he's imitating others. That's imitation of others is one of the biggest ways we learn. Um, but if others in the clinic are not behaving, then it would be important for your son to see that they lose reinforcers when they don't behave well. Um, and, you know, that needs to be pointed out. So when, when that happens, when another child does something bad and loses access to his or her reinforcers, whoever is with your child should point that out. And that is observational learning. And your child will then be like, oh, I don't want to lose my reinforcers. And that way he will learn by observing their bad behavior, he'll learn good behavior. But if they don't do that, and if other children behave poorly and get away with it, then it's very natural that your child would be like, hey, this looks like fun. I might as well try it as well. There we go. Uh, Angel has written in and said, my son will start off sleeping in his bed, but then wakes up later to get in our bed. We let him because we don't want to make him so upset and then he can't go back to sleep. Maybe uh, should we start on weekends he, when he doesn't have school? He's seven. This is that thing that yes. I was talking about before, about how a lot of times, and bless you, Angel, I think it's such a good question, because a lot of times we won't do something because we yeah. don't want to upset the apple cart. Yeah, but, but right. long term, it's, what should she be funny doing? That I, it's funny that I use the example of the child coming and sleeping with you. Yeah. And that is something, yeah, he's seven, you have to start dealing with it. And absolutely start on a Friday when he comes home and that night and Saturday night and even keep going. Usually change in sleep pattern will occur after three nights, three or four. So just keep going with it. You could use a long weekend. Don't wait though, because the sooner you do this, the better. And I know I am so sorry. It's going to be a back and forth for you as well those nights, right? So you'll have to, to ask him not to come in, take him back to his room. Um, and he'll probably come back in. He might get upset and cry. Lots of different things will happen. But, you know, you need to follow through so that he spends the night in his room. Now, there's a few ways you can do this as well. We've talked about this in the past. Uh, you can certainly reverse uh, yourself out of his room. So, in other words, you could have him in his room, um, set up a cot for yourself either in his room or right outside his room so that he feels like you're close to him and gradually move your cot out of his room so that he is accustomed to staying in his own room. You could reward him heavily for staying in his room, like his favorite uh, whatever reinforcer he could get if he stays the night in his room. Um, you could also, depending on, he's seven, but I don't know how much he understands, you could tell him he can come to you when it's daylight outside. There's lots of different things, but the sooner you um, functionally teach him that that is his place to sleep and this is yours, the better it is. Because honestly, you know, imagine if you start trying to teach this when he's 15, like it just starts to get harder and harder. Absolutely. Esther has got a question that, oh my goodness. Uh, I need to buckle up here. Hi, Dr. Doreen. Mm -hmm. Is it better to have 30 hours of subpar ABA or 19 hours of high quality ABA per week? Wow. <laughs> I know. That one hurts my head. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and this is a live question, right, Shannon? This is a live question that they're okay, watching great. on so YouTube. So let's ask... If you were to do the 19 hours, what would he be doing the rest of the time? 
instead of doing the 30 hours. So let's say the other 10 hours, what can you replace it with? Because honestly, the answer is, it's better for him to be doing 30 hours, even if it's subpar, as because that's better than doing nothing and not being busy. Now, if you can do 19 hours of really good therapy, and then the other 10 hours, you can do things like speech therapy or OT if he needs it, or I don't know. I don't know, you were spending social time with him or peer activities, um, you know, all of those, those types of things might be really good, but we, I don't want our kids to just be left uh, to do their own thing because then we're going to not use that time well. Okay, she says the rest, he has ESDM and speech and OT. That's okay. That's not bad. I mean, I, and again, I don't know your child's uh, functioning level, so I don't know how the Denver model program is going to work with him. Uh, maybe it's benefiting him, but he has speech, he has OT, that's great. So do the high quality, and my uh, strong recommendation, have everyone in the family learn from the high quality people, so that even when he's not officially in ABA, everyone is treating him with the same rules. And then that is great. She says that he has something Monday to Friday from 1 to 7 p.m. and preschool in the mornings in a special ed class. I mean, honestly, that sounds pretty good, 1 to 7 p.m. That's a lot of hours, right? And I don't know about the special ed preschool. That's you my question. You should probably observe that. Um, I'm not a big fan of special ed preschool, just, just me, because usually when I have a preschool age child, I'm doing a ton of really good quality ABA. And even if the child is ready for school, I'm not sure I start with special ed. I usually try to start with regular ed. And if it's too much for the child, then I'll do regular ed with an aid. And if that's too much for the child, then I'll do special ed. So it's kind of like I go through this phases before just going to special ed. But that said, you also have the weekends and you can also fill them with high quality activities and learning opportunities as well. It's all just about learning opportunities. You know, today, Shannon, I saw a speech therapist doing a program with a child, which I felt was better than the ABA person I saw. So yeah. sometimes you just have a higher response from the child and they're doing a great program. You just need to do more of that. Well, I love going back to, you know, the explanation that you always give about when you guys were doing the Young Autism Project about that the idea oh, yeah. was making yeah. every, you, you tell it, you tell it better, every waking hour thing. Yeah, it was all waking hours. And that is actually, it, it's so funny because I had not even realized that it is all waking hours right and i had because forever the original articles were uh, that we when we published the study on intensive aba everyone started talking about it being 40 hours a week and i was like okay i guess it was 40 hours a week and then i started remembering uh, honestly the voice in my head of Ivar Lovas, who was the person who actually took the principles of ABA and applied them to autism. And it was his original work that showed intensive ABA works and, and helps recover children. And it was like, no, you know, Ivar always used to say all waking hours. And the way that we had it at UCLA was that we, the, uh, you know, the, the clinicians and the students who were trained, we would work with the children during the time that the parents were at work and that was 40 hours usually and then we would train the parents to a maximum i mean all the parents in our project were trained to be just like us in fact at clinic when we had meetings the parents had to show demonstrate lessons as well and then the parents were supposed to continue doing work with the child on any time that we were not there yeah and so it was really all waking hours it wasn't 40 it was 40 plus whatever the parents did 
And then one day I went back and I was just re looking at the 1987 publication, which was the big study that showed ABA works. And I just saw that it actually says all waking hours in there. It doesn't say 40, it says all waking hours. And so that the 40 came about just because those were the hours that parents were at work. And so I think that the more you can do, and this is all goes back to the enriched environment studies, the more you can occupy the child child's brain with enriched activities, yeah. the better. Yes. But let's, but here's where the rub comes that all of us should just stop for a second and think about preschool. Um, because I can picture in my head a preschool where every minute of the preschool, you've got a team of people, not just one teacher, and they're doing finger paints. And while they're doing finger paints, we're talking about what the colors are and mixing yellow and blue and coming up with green, right? That's an enriched environment. Right. But mm -hmm. I can also think of preschools that I've been in where the kids are given a worksheet and, and not that I hate worksheets, but for our kids, if they don't know how to do the worksheet, you know what I mean? So, so it, it's, it, we're, we're using a term, but we're hoping that it's the enriched environment. So I would want to know, is the yeah. preschool yeah. an enriched environment? What are they working on? What accommodations are they doing? Um, but, but she said, thank you so much. And I love you guys. And, and we love you back. But I, I Thanks. love this idea of, of looking at it through the lens of every waking hour enriched environment, because so often when I'm talking to parents and I talk about this 40 hour a week thing, they, they lose their minds. And I understand that completely. Yeah. When somebody said that to me, I think it was Peter Shepard, who I think is watching right now. He said to me 40 hours. I said, you're crazy. You're absolutely out of your mind. But if you say to yeah. me, we want every waking hour to be an enriched environment, and then the further question is, how much of that as a parent can you take on, and how much of that would you like help and support, then all of a sudden people are like, can you give me 40 hours? I'd like 40 hours right. worth of support. Um, then it's a different discussion. But I, uh, but I think Peter is watching. Yeah. Uh, thank yeah, you, yeah. Peter. And I will add, Shannon, that it's, you know, there are different levels of enriched and um, obviously a one-to-one -one really high quality intervention, whether it's speech or ABA or something else that the child needs is very enriched. But yeah. then there are other levels of things that could be enriched as well, you know, or classified as an enriched environment, especially today. Well, I mean, now you, you mentioned Peter, another really amazing activity, obviously for our kids, which has, a lot to do with brain development is music, yes. right? Teaching the child musical types of activities or drama, which will teach the child to use social and emotional types of expressions very well. Or any of these other, you know, art, where, where there's so many benefits to art, like not just the aspect of, uh, you know, eye-hand coordination or fine motor, but also creativity and the development of creativity and how that can actually lead to heightened self-esteem. Like all of these types of things are extremely beneficial. And if you cannot access something like that, th these days there's also a high level of technology that can call it, that can give you some form of enriched activity. And, you know, and then you kind of keep going down the line and yeah, at the very end of the day, watching a, educational program on TV as opposed to, you know, junk is, is also going to be better, right? It's all different levels. Yes. Um, and, but I love that Esther has written back and said that his preschool is honest, very good. And there are four good. kids and three teachers. I'm, I'm, I'm liking great, that. Great. Loving that. Great. I want to get to our dear friend, Christina, who I'm sending big hugs. Um, because I know you've been going through a lot lately. She said, my son is dealing with repeating a question before giving his answer. How can I deal with this? He is seven now. I cannot believe that he is seven already. She wants to know what she's doing wrong. We've been working on spontaneous language with our son and seeing progress, but lately we are hearing the repeating. Uh, he repeats out questions before he gives his independent answer. And I've been trying not to prompt him in any way, but what am I doing wrong? Help me. We're saying hi also to Sharon 
Aragon, thrilled to have you with us, and to Pantoja. I saw you on there somewhere. I know you're there. Uh, but what for Christina, who we're sending a hug, uh, what can we do about that repeating? And that's pretty common too, right? That you ask a question and some kids will repeat the question back before giving the answer. How can we work on yeah. that? Yeah, and echolalia, that's called echolalia. And is uh, traditionally the thought is that, that echolalia is when the child doesn't understand very well. But I'm not sure that's always the case. It could be that. But I feel like sometimes it's also for some children, it's they're thinking out loud, which is kind of interesting. For other children, they're repeating it just to see what your expression is because they're afraid of saying something wrong. There's lots of different reasons that I think kids repeat what they've heard. Um, I think if you're working with a behavioral team, they might have some ways of blocking the ver vocal response that is echolalia and then allowing him to just give the answer. One simple way is just to, you know, put your finger on his lips so that he doesn't repeat the question and then prompt him with the beginning of the correct answer. You can just prompt him with the beginning of the correct answer if you can get in there fast enough. So for instance, if I said, what is your name? And instead of the child saying, what is your name, Aaron, um, I would just say, what is your name? Ah, and then that would prompt him to start with Aaron. And so you can do a lot of different ways of prompting that. Some children are visual and you can hold up the response so that they know that this is the response. There's lots of lessons that teach the child the difference between saying a statement and asking a question. Um, but do, do, Shannon, you said you know mom. Yeah. Does she have a behavioral program? Uh, she did, and uh, her program was cut. And so yeah. she has had to work very hard to be doing this on her own in a place yeah, so where there is not a lot I know of... who this is now. Yes. Um, yeah, so I think that you uh, try that. Try to, because if I remember correctly, your child is pretty high functioning and could easily get the prompt of the difference between a question and an answer. So why don't you just tr try to prompt the beginning of the answer when you ask a question and let's see if that helps. Yeah, and I also want to acknowledge that mom said she got good test results back and I can't tell you that made hey. me immediately hey. well up. I'm so happy to hear that, sending you big hugs. Um, Anna has written in and said, uh, this, this question is for me, but I want you to weigh in on it as well. She said, my son has ABA, school, speech, PT, and OT. We also have another child, same age, and my ASD son with speech therapy and Girl Scouts. What did you do as a parent not to get burned out? And I want to say that I did get burned out, and I only had the one child, and there were yeah. days when I couldn't do it. And there were yeah. days when I didn't believe. Um, I will tell you that I was surrounded by a great team who would pick, and sometimes it was my husband, that he would pick up the slack on the day when I di didn't have it, or I had a couple of yeah. friends, but my ABA team would believe even when I didn't, and I try to thank them as often as I can. Um, and I yeah. would be honest with them and say, I'm struggling instead of, because it would have been my thing before this that I would try to hide it and make it look like I had it all together. But Anna, I did not. I, yeah. you know, I didn't. And my team pulled around me when they understood that I was struggling and what I wanted. And they would remind me about why are we doing this? And they would remind me that it was not forever. It was very hard for me to believe that when they were saying that to me because I thought that it was gonna, this was gonna be our reality forever. I still have to pinch myself on days and go, I can't believe we got through that. And, and we not yeah. only survived, we came out of it closer. Um, but yeah. it was because we had a good team and that's why I started the show by saying, I thank God every day that I got to meet Dr. Grampiche because I don't know where I would have been. And- Shannon, honestly, so you, were, you were very brave and you were very strong. I mean, I've worked with a lot of parents and you both were very strong, you particularly, and very consistent. And I think with par a lot of parents, 
they really struggle. They get exhausted, first of all. Yes. I mean, the, yes. oh, it's not just overwhelmed, but the exhaustion factor, right? And I think the more people you can involve into your support group, the more important it is. It's It gets easier fast when your child is doing well. Um, the parents that I really, I think, struggle and have a hard time, it's where their child has a little bit of a longer uh, beginning, right? Either yeah. due to health issues or just other issues where the child struggles a little bit longer. Um, that is extremely exhausting, but it does help to have other people help and it does help absolutely to maintain the hope. I mean, you know, without hope, we just give up. Absolutely. I, uh, my husband has just tuned in and honey, I just said wonderful things about you. You just missed it. Uh, <laughs> but I also want to say too, that one of the things that I feel like we did that helped us with the burnout is that we learned what they were doing with our kids, um, mm -hmm. with our with our child. But I, I'm thinking about the other parents too that that survived and survived well. That we learned what they were doing so that it wasn't this big mystery. And as soon as as soon as I started to learn what they were doing and saw that it would work with my son, that that propelled us. And I always had a picture in my head of where we were going. Uh, you know, and, and the picture that was in my head was that he was going to graduate yeah. from high school. He was going to be standing there in a cap and gown and that I didn't know what his world was going to look like because we don't know what outcomes are. Right. But that I was going to be able to say to him, we did everything that we could. And that yeah. was what okay. was important to me. That isn't maybe what's important to you, but I wanted to be able to say that I'm weeping. Um, I wanted to be able to say that and know that it was true and that we had not left anything on the table. And sometimes that means doing the yeah. prescription that's written for your child and pushing people to give you that much service. But I, I, I always described, you know how a narwhal or a unicorn, they have that, that horn on their head? And that was the horn on my head. We had a funding source that was the state of California that was going to pay we fought for it, but he got a 40 hour program. And so we were gonna do that hell or high water. And that was the horn on my head because I wanted to stand there and say, we did everything that we could. That motivated me through everything that there was, Anna. So I always, when I talk to parents, I always say, get clear on what your why is. That was what mine was. It's not going to be what yours is, but get clear on what that is and pu put something in your house, like on the refrigerator, on a kitchen cabinet of where you're going to. Then you got to take each step knowing that's where we're trying to get to. That helped a lot. Anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely. Last night I was listening to, I'm, you know, on the other side of the word right now. So I have a lot of jet lag going on. So last <laughs> night I was sure. listening to a podcast and it was about motivation mm. and it was really interesting because it really all was all about what you just said which is putting in front of you and most of the time no matter what we aspire it, to do it has to do with improving the quality of life for yes. ourselves right yes. and for our children obviously and so having a, a constant reminder of that um is the only way that you will maintain motivation and if you have that right in front of you and you constantly look at that you will continue to strive to reach that whereas on if you don't on difficult days days we all tend to just give up and forget yep yep uh and it is interesting i you know i was somebody who was so interested in self-help before I had my son and I, you know, I was a loyal Oprah watcher and I would get all the books from all the experts and read all of them. And I, I couldn't really apply it to my own life as much as I wanted to. But it's interesting that as soon as my son was diagnosed with autism, I was like, oh, I got to do everything that I know from having read those books. And I frequently say, if I could apply the, that horn on my head thing with how sure I was about where we were going to every aspect of my life, my life would be amazing in, in ways that, you know, it's amazing now, but it could be better. 
Uh, I got to get to yep. this question or Marina is going to stop speaking to me. Uh, somebody wrote in on your website and said, respected doctor, I'm from India. I've seen your video on YouTube regarding methylcobalamin injection. Uh, my four-year-old son is autistic. I have been with functional medicine since six months. Many things have improved, but I am totally stuck uh, with expressive language. So I'm planning to give the methyl uh, cobalamin injection here in India. Functional medicine specialists don't have any idea, and we're talking about the methyl B12 shots, you guys. That's the actual name for it, the methyl cobalamin. Um, but she says his serum B12 is currently 1242 PGML, um, and they want, and she wants to know um, can she give the injection herself? Mm. Uh, yeah, you could normally give the injection yourself. It's a very easy um, under the skin type of injection. But I, I the serum B so, so uh, methyl B twelve is basically the natural form of B twelve or or cobalamin, and so, and then there's cyanocobalamin, which is like the manufactured type of B twelve. And we do usually try to give methyl because it's absorbed much better, et cetera, et cetera. But the serum level that you just quoted, Shannon, to me seems pretty normal or even a little bit above normal. So I wouldn't give any kind of B12. Okay. That's not what any doctor would recommend to you with that serum level. Okay. So I, I would probably be looking at other interventions that can help increase expressive language, which obviously would be speech and ABA. Okay. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Uh, we, uh, do we have time for one more question? We, we got, we've got like a sure. minute. Okay. Uh, my four-year-old produces echolalia, but doesn't say the name of objects when asked. Oh, and this is from the same parent because she just quoted the same thing and I just got to your question. Okay. But so she's, but we know a little bit more. She's got echolalia, um, but doesn't say mm -hmm. the name of objects when, when asked. So you would encourage speech and ABA. Yeah, for sure. And that's actually really good if the child has a, a, a echolalia because that is the beginning of speech. So yeah, I would definitely highly recommend a lot of speech and ABA to get things going. But I hope so you awesome. I hope you just heard that uh, Dr. Grampiche is not recommending the methyl B12 shot with your child's current serum levels. So I hope that you had heard that. All right. I just want to thank everybody for pulling together, finding us on the places that you found us and writing in. I want to thank Dr. Grampiche for being willing. It's nighttime. She's been on planes for two days, has worked all day where she is. Yeah, I tell you, plane would not be a problem, Shannon. I think I'm on my like 13th hour here right now, oh and I'm gosh. actually just starting to do some stuff for the U.S., so I'll be up for a few more hours, but it was a pleasure and I'm so glad and thankful to you and Chris that we could make this happen today. Absolutely. And I want to thank you and everybody else. I'm sending you big hugs. We'll look forward to having you back. I think you're back next week. I have to check the schedule. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up. I will be on a plane next week. So okay. I won't be able to, uh, unfortunately, do the show and we'll have uh, a replay. Okay. All right. But... But thank you all for being a part of this and tuning in. And please continue to check out askdrdoreen.com where there are updates and things on that page. Please, if you have not already, subscribe to the podcast that is Ask Dr. Doreen. It used to be that if you had Autism Live and subscribed to Autism Live, you would automatically get Ask Dr. Doreen. I believe that is stopped. So we want you to be subscribing to just Ask Dr. Doreen and Just Autism Live. It will help you because we're going to send you more specific messages about each one of those things. It, we're not going to, you know, we don't send you overly things, but, uh, but please subscribe. And if you're going to be in the Los Angeles area, don't forget, we're selling tickets right now for the All Ghouls Gala. If you can get to Los Angeles to be there for that, it's an adult Halloween party that benefits Autism Care Today. That's the charity founded by Dr. Grampiche. Do you want to tell them who is going to be there, Dr. Grampiche, who our honorees Dr. are? Dr. Temple Grandin, which is like so amazing. 
Um, and of course, also our dear friend, Joe Montaigne, wonderful. And also Arriva Martin. So it's going to be a wonderful event. Very excited about it. Coming up, Shannon, less than a month. Less than a month. It happens on October 28th here in Woodland Hills. I will be there. Dr. Grant Pichet will be there. Dr. Temple Grandin, Joe Montaigne, Arriva Martin, plus there's so many other celebrities that have already said that they want to be there to help us honor these three wonderful guests. We want you guys to come. It is a party um, and it's a very low ticket price. If you can't come because you're not in Los Angeles, please share it on, we're, we're posting on social media. Please share it on social media so other people know. If you do have the ability to buy a ticket for someone else that can attend it, you know, there are autism parents that would love to attend, but um, are not quite able. It's, it's a very low ticket price uh, as these things go. It's all the alcohol and food included. Um, there are some other ways to spend more money while you're there and we hope that you will. Um, but we're very excited for all the things. We're out of time now. Dr. Grand Pichet, thank you so much for everything. Thank you, Shannon. Love thank you, you Chris. So Always thank lovely. You. Thank all you, everyone. All right. We are going to be back tomorrow morning with a live show. Uh, and I don't remember what the topic is. I am so silly that I just had a total brain bubble. But we're having a parent to parent tomorrow. Um, and, and, oh, I know exactly what it is, uh, things that you can be doing at school. So uh, mm. please tune in for that. Uh, and until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.